All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ISMM webinar. This format today will be 20 minutes slide presentation followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. I've placed all attendees on mute to avoid us all speaking at the same time. So if you have any questions, please use the chat function and send them across to me so I can ask Simon on your behalf after his presentation. Today, Simon Raybould will be talking about the science of presenting. Simon started his life as a researcher. His original research was as a geostatistician but he's also worked as a drug education officer, teacher, lighting designer, actor, author, trainer, and playwright. He's also a reasonably competent fire eater. It's with great pleasure that I'm introducing you to our host today, Simon Raybould. Hi, good morning. I do like that line about a reasonably pro competent fire eater on the grounds that all fire eaters are competent. They're either, they're either competent or they're dead. There's, there's no middle ground for fire eating. So. Welcome, good morning, hello. I'm going to scuttle through some stuff about presentations and then take any and all questions, so we'll see we'll see how it goes. Hopefully you can see the, the slides on the screens and hopefully you've got an idea of what it is we're talking about. I'm going to be drawing upon 400 research papers that we ploughed through for uh, my last book called Presentation Genius, uh, but before I do that I just wanted to give you two items of faith. It seems really strange to start as a scientist and, uh, you know, talk about articles of faith. But here we go. I've got the first one here is, oh, there's me in the corner, presentations aren't about something, they're to do something. And there's a corollary to that, which is that presentations are supposed to change the world. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, presentations are either to cover your backside or to do something. And the second article of faith is this one. In order for people to do something, they need to understand you. And that means that you don't just tell them what you know, you don't just throw a fire hose of information at them. You provide the information they need, and you provide it in the way they need to know it. Okay, so those are my two articles of faith. Everything I'm going to start now is based upon science and lesson until I tell you differently in the questions. So, let's go back to the 1980s, where a guy called John Sweller started to look at things like something called cognitive load. Cognitive load is just a, a, a measure of how difficult or easy it is for people to understand what you're saying. It's at any given point in time it's fixed and it splits into three bits. And those bits are, you can see the labels coming up now, intrinsic, extrinsic, germane. Intrinsic is a measure of how difficult something is to understand when you're making a presentation just because that's how difficult it is to understand. And some people, some things rather, have a higher intrinsic load than others. So rocket science has a higher intrinsic load than bread making. Right? Over by Germain, that's the load you want. That's the stuff in gold. I'll explain what that is in a minute. You want people to be in that bit where they're, they're listening to you. But extraneous load down the bottom, that's the bit that that's the bit you want to avoid because that's how difficult it is for people to understand what you're saying in your presentation because of how well or how badly you're managing to explain something. And the idea being that because in the short term people's capacity to understand things is fixed, what you want to do is reduce the extraneous load and therefore give more space for people in the germane load. Okay? Let me define germane load for you. Germane load is the learning bit. It's when people actually get it and understand it. It's when people translate what you're saying into stuff that they get. Um, in the jargon, those things that they're, they're, they're getting are called schema. Right? Don't worry about the jargon, that's, that's this. But by analogy, I, I want you to cast your mind back to when you drove. And I, I'm learning, assuming here you kind of you can drive a, a, a manual car, which and cast your mind back to when you were changing gears in the first instance, and there are dozens and dozens of things you had to remember to do, if this, then that, and all that kind of stuff. But now, your brain doesn't do that anymore. You've learned how to change gears, so your, your brain has put all of that stuff in a box, it's labeled that box, change gear, and your brain now does nothing more than give one instruction to your body, go away and change gear, come back when you're done. And you're body opens that box and does all the stuff inside it, but it, your brain doesn't have to worry about it at all. And that's what we're going to call a physical schema. Mm -hmm. it's a, a, and the intellectual schema, when people learn things, those are the, the equivalent of those. So what you're trying to do is reduce this bottom stuff in the, the right-hand corner here, the bottom red stuff, so that there's more space for people's heads in the gold. And 
the first bit of today, I'm just going to very quickly go through some things in the red zone here that surprise people. And the first and depressing one is your accent. There's a shed load of research that suggests that if people can't understand you because of your accent, they tend to assume not only do you not know what you're talking about, but a whole bunch of other things about you which are just not fair. Um, things like whether you're a nice person and all of that kind of just gets judged by your accent. The original research comes from America where they gave lectures in, with or without Spanish accents and the students rated the professors and that kind of stuff and said that the professors who were giving the lectures with Spanish accents were less nice, less intelligent, less good presenters, all that kind of stuff, which is a shame because they were the actual professors and the people who didn't have Spanish accents, they were just actors. So the other thing that sometimes takes people a bit by surprise is which font you should use. Now the research for this is not a hundred percent in one way or the other, but the majority of it points towards using things that are called sans serif fonts. Sans serif, uh, those are fonts without flicks and ticks. So what you're seeing here is a sans serif font, it's called Helvetica, it's one of the two that everybody is familiar with, I guess. The other one being Arial, they're very similar, and to be honest, if you can tell the difference, then you need a hobby, because they're, they're just really, really similar. But font is important in two ways. The first is, if it's simple to use and read, people trust you more, people learn more, people understand more, they take on board what you're saying more. But the other reason it's important is because it's a good idea, it turns out, to use familiar fonts because familiar is safe. We're evolutionarily designed to like familiar. The logic being, if we've seen it before, it's not eaten us, so it's safe. Okay, so familiar fonts, please, rather than strange and weird ones. Here's a blindingly obvious one, getting your labels and your diagrams sorted out. It makes an enormous difference, and we can talk about the details of, of what that means in practice later on, but the rule of thumb here is, you really want to be about really unsubtle about labeling your diagrams. Don't make your audience work. So for example, if I gave you a map and said, count how many churches are on it, it would be a lot easier if we do that if I put big red rings around the churches before I gave it to you. It's that level of subtlety that you need. Moving on, I'm falling off the edge here. There's something you can barely do anything about sometimes. Turns out that people listen to you less well. Obviously, if there's background noise, they get that, but very, very often, unfortunately, it turns out, according to research, people assume that you're responsible for the background noise. Now, they know that intellectually that's not the case, but subconsciously the reptile drains around it like that. So if you can do anything to stop the, the coffee machine clinking or the caterers washing up in the background, that's a, that's a great advantage. If they don't like you, they won't learn from you. Okay. It's kind of blindingly obvious. I'm talking to sales and marketing people here. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. So just remember your old TLD training about uh, liking and all of that kind of just. It turns out that that's incredibly important, unbelievably important, topped only by this one. If people don't want to be there, they can't learn from you. It's As soon as I say it, it's blindingly, blindingly obvious. But so many times people try and make presentations when the audience is not prepared to listen. It's just embarrassing. So those are half a dozen of the things that might take people a little bit, a little bit by surprise. But I want to draw heavily now upon the work of this guy. And just to state the obvious, this is Albert Einstein. Okay, now, there's a load of quotes I can use from Einstein when we talk about presentations and stuff. But here's my personal favorite. Everything will be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And the knack for making a good presentation lies in finding that gap there. One of the founders of the Professional Speaking Association in the UK suggests that 80%-ish of presentations fail, and the most common reason they fail is because people do not simplify enough. We call it the curse of the expert. Let me give you an example. If you are teaching a child to tell the time, would you use this watch face or this watch face? Okay, it's not a trick question. I'm hoping the answer is, is, is pretty darn obvious. You'd use the simpler one on the left of the screen as you see it. And yet, by analogy, most presenters work on the right-hand side of the screen because to them, they don't get that the right-hand side of the screen isn't the left-hand side watch because they know it so very, very, very well. They understand all the intricacies about it and they get confused what people don't get it because it's dead simple as far as they're concerned. So we have an exercise, and I'm going off the science here just for a second to give you an exercise. We have a science here. If you can't explain it in a tweet, 
it's too complicated. It's just a discipline, it's just an exercise. I'm not suggesting you literally do it, but just something to hold in the back of your head. Okay, back to the science. Looking now at things that do and don't work a little bit more. Well, one of the things we know that doesn't work uh, are bullet points, traditional bullet point presentations. Now, the research on this varies a little bit, but a lot of the research suggests that if you give a 20-minute traditional bullet point presentation, and then 10 minutes Q&A, which is kind of the equivalent of what I'm doing today, and then you give people tea, coffee, and cake for half an hour, and you ask them questions about what you've told them in the presentation, on average, they only remember 10% of what you've told them. Right? And if you ask the same people the same questions just an hour later, and, oh, this is so depressing, it's unbelievable. On average, they only remember 10% of the original 10%, which means that you're talking about something which is 1% efficient. And for those of you who are selling engineering stuff, can you imagine going to a client, opening a box and going, look, buy my stuff. It is 99% inefficient. You just, you just wouldn't do it. Okay, So we, we, need a, we need a different way. We now know something that works an awful lot better than bullet points. And to illustrate it, I'm going to go back to Einstein and give you that same information in a different way. So this is Albert as he comes out, call him Albert like I know him really. And this Albert as he comes out of a presentation of mine, this is how much he thinks he knows, and after only 24 minutes, uh, sorry, after only 30 minutes, this is what he actually remembers. And over to 24 hours later, this is all that he can remember. Now, not a blank screen, trust me, there is something on there, but I kind of hope that by doing that as an illustration, you realize that there are different ways of presenting the same information. And one of the best ways I've, I've come across of doing that is something called the pie model. And I don't mean pie as in the pie chart that I've just illustrated things on earlier on. I mean this model, the physical, intellectual, and emotional model. Okay? You can see why it's called pie, P I. Turns out, you probably know this already, that people don't change their behaviours based upon intellectual information at all. They only do that if you get them past that red line there, it's called the action barrier, if you get them down to the emotional level of communication. And there's a really silly example I'm going to give you here. I'm in the UK. It must be impossible in the UK to have grown up and not know that smoking is a bad idea. It's expensive, dangerous, it's probably they're going to kill you. It's certainly going to make you. It's certainly going to make you ill. And yet, about a quarter of the population smoke, which is pretty scary. It's impossible for them physically not to have heard the message. They've seen the signs. They've seen the adverts. But that physical communication hasn't been sufficient. In their heads, they know smoking is bad for them. They know it is dangerous. They can quote the statistics, but that intellectual argument hasn't made any difference to them. And it turns out that the things that get people to change their behavior, such as stop smoking, is when something emotional happens to them, such as they get ill, they have a heart attack, and all of that kind of jazz. Your job as a presenter is to get across that action barrier. And there are a number of ways of doing that, and I'll answer questions about them later on. But as a quick, very brief over overview, the best ways to get across the action barrier are, are stories. Ideally, you get stories out of your audience. Good luck with that sometimes. If that doesn't work, you give them you, the, you, know, you give your audience your stories. Okay, that's how we learn. We are hardwired for stories. Cast your mind back when you were a kid. And most of us had parents who read us bedtime stories, and that was how we learned. I'll put money on the fact that nobody read you a bedtime story with a bullet point list in it and said, here is how you learn to be brave. Bullet point one, run to the sound of gunfire. Bullet point two, do that's not what happened. What happened was that the read your story, you identified with the hero. Sorry, ladies, it usually is a hero statistically. The hero was brave, and you learned what brave behavior was from that story. If you don't use stories, then use images, because images are stories captured in a moment of time. And the last one, just to give you completion, is to try and match the medium and the message. I'll talk about that briefly, very late, uh, a little bit later on. But I'm going to deconstruct a slide now so you can see how this works. This is a, a, one of my favorite slides. I tend to show this slide at about 10 o'clock in the morning in my training, and at 4 o'clock, if this is not a slide they remember, I won't send them an invoice. I'm so confident of this slide. So let's deconstruct it. It's a, a traditional bullet point slide that has been heavily modified, as you can see. 
It used to have the title, what you need to make a good presentation, and then three bullet points, you need the right skills, appropriate equipment, correct attitude, all that kind of jazz. I'll just, in a second, just push it into the corner there and deconstruct it so we can have a look at what works. Okay, These are the four scientific principles of what makes a slide have impact. And the first of them is attraction. I'm kind of hoping you'll agree with me that that slide is, is visually appealing. Even if it's not pretty sexy type stuff, it is at least visually appealing, visually striking. And there's good evolutionary reasons for us being into attractive stuff. It's because stuff that is revolting to us is actually dangerous. Okay. So there's the first one. Um, Actually, some interesting evidence about this. If, um, if you go to courts of law where it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, it turns out even in an environment like that, attraction uh, is important. If you're a, if you're a good-looking defendant, you are statistically less likely to be found guilty, and all kinds of things like that. Okay, the second of the four key points here is integration. Interestingly, the research behind this started out for focus groups of children in Sesame Street, the Tid Kids TV program, uh, which was one of the forerunners of the Muppets, an astonishing piece of, uh, piece of research. Hopefully you can see that the words skills, equipment, attitude are integrated to the picture because they are the same colour as much of the sea on the earth, but at the same time you don't have to struggle to read them because they're set against the black shadow. So that integration thing doesn't have to be done by uh, by colour, the way I've done it there, but it does need for the, for the whole slide to feel like the whole thing. The third of these uh, is pattern. Okay, It is easier for us to remember pattern than random facts. So here's the pattern. Um, the acronym there, SEA, makes it easier to remember. And if I'm presenting live, I make a big issue of that kind of stuff. But no, silly example, ask yourself a question. If I wrote down 270 words, one word per index card, and I scattered those index cards across the floor and said, you've got 10 minutes, memorize them. Not many of you manage it. Some would, sure, but not many. But if I rearranged those cards so that they formed the lyrics of, oh, I don't know, a, a, a Katy Perry pop song, no matter whether you like Katy Perry or not, it's not the point, but it'd be much easier to remember those lyrics after 10 minutes because a pop song has rhyme, rhythm, pattern, scan, and all of that kind of jazz. It just makes it easier to remember. And the fourth of the big ones here is something called backstory. Backstory is hugely complicated, but basically it boils down to the emotional investment your audience does in your slides. Silly example time coming up, a guy called Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway is famous for a short story, only six words long. A short story of six words. How much of a story can you get into six words? Here they are. Now, I'm betting that you're not thinking that's a story. It's not. The story is what's made up in your head when you go, oh, how sad, because that's just an advert. But that's an example of what I mean by backstory, the work your audience does in their heads to emotionally engage makes your slides more impactful, makes your presentation more effective, and makes it more likely that people remember what you're saying. I'm going to work through that, the last three or four minutes here, I'm just going to work through that as an example. Let's talk about what people are frightened of. There's a whole bunch of research, started out in 1973, and I'm sure you've heard all the fears, of, uh, all the stuff about more people being frightened of public speaking than dying. It's not literally true, but if you take those statistics and you put them in your traditional bullet point format like this, and I show this slide to people and I say, give this marks out of 10 for interest and memorableness. Okay. So if you set aside the fear content, because yes, fear is always interesting, if you just pretend that's a shopping list or something, and just give the design marks out of 10, you just do that now for me, and most people say, on average, I get an average of two, something along those lines. I can double it to four, usually, just by changing the color scheme. So remember I said that one way of getting across that action barrier to change things was to match the medium and the message. And because this is about fear, I've just tipped it onto white on black rather than black on white. But here's what happens when I start to use images. So here's the third scariest thing, the second scariest thing. And you'll notice that I've not brought in the numbers here. I bring in the numbers afterwards. 
and then the scariest thing, and again I bring in the statistics afterwards because you want people to be interested before you give them the data. You'll also notice, by the way, on passant, I've brought in the, the data smaller so it doesn't make the snake as unscary. Okay. Now usually when I slow, show those slides I get scores of 8 out of 10 rather than 2 out of 10 because that's what makes the, the impact, it's the emotional content, not the data. Very, very briefly, let me just give you an example of ma matching the medium and the message. 20, a few years ago for my 25th wedding anniversary, I secretly learned to waltz without telling my wife. Marks out of 10, please, for romantic, everybody. That was pretty cool, huh? So here's me, here's me dancing with my wife. Stunning, huh? Uh, not me, the, not my wife, obviously. Um, and uh, the thing about that is that the lady who taught me to waltz did not show bullet points and say left foot bullet point two, right foot, bullet point three, left foot. What she actually did was physically grab my legs and move me because PowerPoint is not the right way to do things. It's a question of matching the medium and the message to get the medium as close to the actual message as you possibly, possibly can. Right. Last 30 seconds, if you're finding that you want to follow up on this, and I'm going to take questions, I'll take as many questions as anybody wants forever and ever, but if you want to follow up on Twitter, there you go. If you want to go to the website, there you go. If you want to talk about the presentation stuff, there you go. Or if you're desperate, you could rush out and buy the book. And I promise that I would speak for 20 minutes. I've actually spoken for 19 minutes and 55 seconds. There we go. Bit of a whistle-stop tour. Happy to take as many questions from anybody as anybody possibly, possibly wants. But uh, I hope that's been a useful overview. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have had a few questions come in. So the first one okay, we've got go is um, you had a pop at the visual, auditory and kinesthetic thing in your slides. I don't suppose shooting that myth down makes you many friends, but are they another big myth that people accept about making presentations? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. Um, I, don't, I mentioned en passant when I talked about um, matching the medium to the message and, and that kind of stuff. It turns out empirically when you test the visual auditory kinesthetic model, it doesn't have any effect at all. It's a hypothetical model, it doesn't have any impact whatsoever. What does have an impact, well, if you try and do that, it does have an impact, which is it makes the presenter more stressed, obviously, uh, but it doesn't have any impact on learning. What does make an impact on learning is matching up the medium and the message, trying to match the way you say things to what it is that you are trying to say rather than going, I need to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic about this, what you do is you go, is this a kinesthetic thing to learn? Yes, then learn it kinesthetically. Is this a visual thing to learn? Then yes, learn that visually. Don't try and do visual, auditory, kinesthetic for everything. It's just too much like hard work. doesn't have any impact. Okay. Sorry about that. So all of those who have paid for visual, auditory, kinesthetic training, no evidence of it working at all. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Okay, next question. And you're right, that doesn't, that doesn't make me popular. Sorry, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, it's pretty common for my boss to ask me to make presentations at short notice. That rules out a lot of preparation time. So how do I get a good presentation without putting in the hours? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a really tricky one. Firstly, you try and get yourself a more reasonable boss um, and try and avoid it. Any rehearsal you can do is going to be a good thing. And my experience of that kind of boss is that they tend to provide you with a shed load of overload of information. Um, with that information, you don't want it on the slides because people get bored of the bullet points, but you can put it into something called presenter view um, or presenter notes so that you, you can see stuff on your laptop that the audience doesn't see projected onto the screen. So even if you don't have time to prepare and rehearse, you can at least have notes which are you know, they're available and visible to you, even if they're not available and visible to the audience. It's a dirty trick, but I found it incredibly handy. There are other things, but that's, that's yeah, probably that's the main one. Try and rehearse if you can. Try and talk your way out of it if you can. If you can't, then um, go for presenter viewing and hide your notes on your laptop. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question. What's the worst presentation mistakes people make? <laughs> um, throwing a, a, a power hose of information at people, just like I've just done. I've just taken 20 minutes and gone, 
how much information can I give people in 20 minutes? I'm not expecting people to remember that. I'm kind of hoping that they go, oh, that's interesting, and then come back with questions for those bits that are relevant. But the major mistake that people make is not simplifying enough. In my experience, and I'm stepping away from science here just to give my experience, my experience is one of the other most common problems is that they don't know exactly what they are trying to achieve with that presentation. They tend to make presentations about the new policy on so and so and so and so, whereas in fact the best thing for them to do is to try and make a presentation so that the people adopt the new policy on so and so and so and so. It's, it sounds like semantics, but it's it's a remarkably powerful shift in mindset. So here you go, two, two big mistakes. The first is not simplifying enough. The second is not knowing exactly what you want out of the presentation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next question, what is the best way to spice up and engage the audience and move into the emotional zone when you're presenting numerous sales figures in a presentation? <laughs> um, nobody cares about the sales figures, people care about what the sales figures mean. Okay, so what you need to try and do is explore the, the, the storyline behind that. So for an example, a trend is a story, an average is a story. Um, stability is a story. Nobody actually cares about the data. The best way to, pra to pass that kind of data over to people, I'm afraid, is, is pieces of paper. And a presentation is much more efficient, is much more appropriate for discussing what those pieces of, what the data on those pieces of paper actually mean. Okay. Now, if you can't actually manage that, the best thing to do is to provide that information visually and graphically rather than tabular form, because it's just that little bit more engaging. Uh, don't go over the top with animations, but if you can get a little bit of movement onto the screen as well, that also helps. Okay, so the key thing there, get behind the figures to what the figures actually mean. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, how do you get over the fear? Oh, right. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of specific tools. Um, and there's, I, I've got a whole video YouTube channel where I discuss that kind of stuff, and if people want to watch that, that's fantastic. Um, for those techniques and, and, and stuff, I would recommend you go to youtube.com Presentation Genius. But for now, let me just ask people this question. When you learn to ride a bike, what you did was lean the bike against the wall, look at it, and go, I'm going to get on that bike when I'm feeling confident. Right? No, that's not what you did at all, is it? Right? You got on, you fell off. You got back on, you fell off again. A lot of the time, people make this idea mistake of thinking that present. You get confident at making presentations, and then you do them. And I'm afraid that's not how it works. You do get you get confident by doing the presentations. But just like riding a bike, you don't you know you don't stand in front of an audience of 500 in your first gig. You put stabilizers on. You make presentations, practice presentations to small and safe audiences, and gradually get more and more robust. But don't forget there are a million techniques that you can use as well. Happy to talk about those. But that big philosophical point is the, is, is, is the main one, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you for that. The next question is, what is the best way to know if the audience are interested in the presentation or not? If you've decided exactly what the presentation is supposed to change, you will have a really good metric to measure the success of your presentation by looking at whether that thing that you were trying to make change actually happened. So if you're trying to get people to adopt a new policy on this or buy such and such or do so and so, you know how successful your presentation has been because you know whether they've done that or not. Um, that's the success of it. The interest bit comes a little bit from more, more from experience, I'm afraid. Don't be tempted to panic if they're not moving because that could just be that they're thinking or their body language is different from what you expect it to be, or that they are introverts, or that they are shy. The best judge I've ever found so far is for them to, is whether they ask questions at the end or not. And people often fear that, kind of fear the questions, and they go, oh, I'm terrified of the questions, I have no idea what's coming up. Um, well, yeah, that's great, but people only ask questions if they care, so questions are a good thing. The worst thing that can happen at the end of presentations is tumbleweed. So the best way to find out if they were interested is if they ask you questions. 
Great, thank you for that. Our next question, we have a few more coming in now. Um, are pictures more important to relate to something than quantitative data? Yes. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Um, the, best combination, okay. <laughs> the best combination I use is images to get people interested and then provide the quantitative data once they are interested. Um, otherwise, you can do try, do try and do dirty tricks like try and combine the two. So, for example, I've got slides where I talk about um, doubling the effectiveness of attempts to give up smoking, and the number doubles from 6 to 12 as you do these certain things, and actually literally have the number 12 at a font size twice the size of, of, of the number 6. So the actual data becomes a story in itself, if you see what I mean. But by and large, you give them the emotional stuff to get them interested, and then you give them the data. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. What is the most effective time length, um, length of time for a presentation to have the greatest impact? Oh, that's a really hard one. Whoever asked that one, I don't like you anymore. And um, the the answer is a piece of string. As long as it takes, and no longer. And I can't answer the question specifically, and I'm ever so sorry about this because it depends entirely upon what it is that you're trying to say. Some things can be said in two minutes, so after two minutes you should shut up. Some things take two hours, so you have to schedule a two-hour meeting. I think, however, that what the question might be getting at is how long can people concentrate for, and the research evidence for that is completely up in the air. Um, different people concentrate at different times in different ways and different circumstances. There's no overall pattern. You'll hear statistics quoted such as eight minutes of intensive concentration or 20 minutes of medium concentration. And yes, there is some evidence of that. That is the average possibly, but the standard deviation around that is so very, very wide. It's kind of, ooh, I hesitate to actually give an answer to that question. I'm so sorry to have answered that question, whoever asked that question. There is no definitive answer. So sorry. Okay, thank you for that. Next question. Um, are you saying that you need to know your audience and their what's in it for me factor first? No, yes, that's always good. Because nobody comes to a presentation to watch you, do they? Unless your name is Bill Gates or something like that, nobody comes to see you. They come with a what's in it for me. Sometimes you can guess the what's in it for me, sometimes you can't. It's much, much easier if you can guess the what's in it for me. And to be honest, if you haven't made a reasonable stab at the what's in it for me, you shouldn't be doing a presentation in the first place. The what's in it for me aligns very tightly with the what is going to change. Okay? And it's the what's in it for me also aligns with that point I made earlier on about social context. If people don't want to be there, there's no point in them being there. So anything you can do in advance of the training to find out there what's in it for me, including do they actually want to be there, is always going to be a good thing. A trick I've used in the past, by the way, is to make my best guess at the what's in it for me, design two presentations, do a show of hands thing near the beginning of the presentation to find out which of my best guesses is the most accurate one, and actually skipped over slides if necessary. So maybe I've assumed that there are, let's pretend that there are two what's in it for me to the audience. Let's call them A and B. I start off with slides one, two, and three. And at slide C, I ask, slide three, I ask them, which of the two what's in it for me are you interested? If they say, slide, uh, what's in it for me, A, I continue with what I've got. If they say, what's in it for me, B, I skip over all the slides that talk about what's in it for me, A, and I skip slide 19 or whatever, I'm making these numbers up, the audience doesn't see me skipping over those slides, and I give them the presentation that addresses their what's in it for me as best guess. Now the downside is I've had to present, I've had to prepare two presentations effectively and put them in the same slide deck, but it does make me look so much cooler when I do that, because I can address their what's in it for me is much more directly. Sorry to waffle on, the short answer is yes, the longer answer is research it, and if you can't research it, guess and prepare two presentations. Thank you for that. Okay, our next question is, what are the best icebreakers? Okay, this is moving away from presenting and into training a little bit. In a literal 20-minute presentation, it's very hard to fit in the time for an icebreaker. 
might this is a personal thing rather than a research thing. My personal thing is that icebreakers should move forward the content of what you're saying rather than be icebreakers per se. Partially because half the population at least hates icebreakers and they're very contrived in many cases. So what I try and do is design my icebreaker to deal with the content. It might be something like a quick show of hands for who has this problem. Who has that problem? Who has the other problem? I want to spend 30 seconds now explaining to your neighbour um, what you've done to overcome that problem that you've just that you just self-identified. Um, anything that moves the problem forwards rather than just breaks the ice for the sake of breaking the ice. Okay, thank you. That comes to an end to all of our questions. Um, this comes to an end of our webinar as well now. We seem to be pretty much on time. Um, thank you, Simon, for your presentation. Uh, everyone, please make sure to check the ISMM website for uh, upcoming events and web webinars coming up sort of in the future. Thank you for all coming. We will see you soon, hopefully. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.